Gut, das Wort hat die äh, Vielen Dank. Ähm, ich kann dann jetzt ein bisschen beeilen, denn wir haben ja noch einen Sprecher äh, am Ende und äh, wir entschuldigen mich, wenn das jetzt vielleicht ein bisschen schnell geht. Äh, das, äh, ich muss in Englisch sprechen während des, des, des Vortrages. Ja. So this is joint work with uh, Jeremy Venice, also uh, of the IMF. This paper has been out for about uh, two years. A usual IMF disclaimer applies uh, with force in this case. I say no more. So the uh, Chicago plan was uh, um, conceived in the late 20s and 30s uh, was the result of a very deep debate about uh, how to fix the financial system, make it safer after what has been experienced uh, in the Great Depression. In fact, it actually started a little bit before the Great Depression. And what uh, the Chicago plan proposed was the separation of the monetary and credit functions of banking. So that's pretty much what Dr. Huber, Professor Huber uh, described here in words, and we're going to describe it also uh, in words too, but then also in terms of a cutting edge ESG model where we're playing through some scenarios. So what the separation means is that deposits must be backed 100% by reserves of public money or Dr. Huber's preferred terminology is that deposits are, in fact, sovereign money. Uh, that, and, and secondly, that credit cannot be financed by the creation of bank deposits ex nihilo. Now, I want to uh, dwell on that first point a little bit more. Uh, we need to first... Before we start to build a model of how we could reform the financial system, we need to actually understand how the financial system works. Okay? And I would propose that the models that we have out there in the literature today, including everything that came after 2007, suffers from an important misconception. Okay? So what banks do not do is to intermediate pre-existing real loanable funds. And if you look at every single model out there, that's what they all say. Okay? Rather, what they do is they create new money in the act of lending. And this is not something that we can debate by looking at empirical evidence. It's a fact, not a theory. Okay? This is just simply something that is, is, is part of the nuts and bolts of the system. And there, there are two beautiful uh, papers came out by the Bank of England in March in their quarterly bulletin, McLean, Radia, and Thomas, which describes this beautifully and very succinctly. And I, I recommend it highly. So the main constraints for banks, therefore, uh, in expanding lending are solvency and profitability. Do I want to make a new loan or not? I do not need to have real loanable funds before I, want to, before I can lend something, okay? So the banks need to decide, is this a good business proposition? So how banks can start a lending boom is, that by, by, is by simply simultaneously growing the asset side and the liability side of their balance sheet by creating new money. They do not have to attract deposits of existing money first. And you know, you could say, well, we all know that. Well, apparently, if you look at the models that are being pro uh, promulgated out there, we don't. Really, we don't, because this is not in those models. Um, secondly, the deposit multiplier, or the reserve position doctrine, uh, says that central bank fixes some narrow monetary aggregate, and then broad monetary aggregates are a function of narrow money. In the real world, it's exactly the opposite way around. Reserves are created after broad money is created. And again, this is a fact, not a theory. And again, the Bank of England paper, and many, many central bank publications, if you look in the right place, will tell you this. Okay? And the most beautiful summary in this one sentence is this statement by Alan Holmes, Vice President of the New York Federal Reserve, 1969. In the real world, <laughs> banks extend <coughs> creating deposits in that process and look for the reserves later. That is the way the process goes, and not the other way around. Okay? Now, this is sort of a, a, a cartoonish representation of the different modeling strategies that are out there. And the top is the loanable funds theory. So we have savers and borrowers. Typically, one of them is patient, and the other one is impatient. The patient guy deposits something in the bank, and then the impatient guy borrows it, and then he goes and does something with it. But all of this is in terms of goods, in terms of resources. And if you look at the budget constraint, it actually, what actually happens in these models is that somebody has to save real resources, has to consume less or produce more in order to put something in the bank. Okay? The reality is what's happening at the bottom here. 
There's no state bank borrower. There's one guy who goes to the bank and says, I need lo a loan because I need monetary purchasing power. I don't need goods. I need monetary purchasing power. Mm -hmm. I get a loan and a deposit. They're both in my name. There's no saver. It's just me and the banker. And then I take that money and I purchase goods using money. And, and, and this is, of course, how it really works. This is because banks are fundamentally monetary institutions. Now think about some of the things that are being uh, uh, mentioned out there in the literature when people talk about banks. Banks accept deposits. What an individual bank in partial equilibrium, yes, accepts deposits. But the banking system as a whole does not accept deposits from non-banks. The only deposits that they can accept is made by way of a check that is drawn on a deposit that already exists elsewhere. Okay? So the only way in which you could say that banks accept deposits is if you say that somebody deposits goods in the bank and the bank uh, writes a receipt for that. So somebody drives up to the bank with a piece of gravel manufacturer and has a truck full of gravel and dumps it in front of the bank. And the bank lends the gravel. That's literally the story that is being told. I'm not kidding. And, uh, and the, other, the other story is uh, banks intermediate real savings. Banks, inter banks are intermediaries. Right? Banks intermediaries. No, it doesn't need to be the gravel. This could be anything. No, no, no. It doesn't need to be the gravel. It could be anything. It could just be the good gravel. It's not saving. It's not saving. It's real good. It's real good. It's real good. It's real good. Look, I have made loans for five, I made loans for five years. All right? It could just be the good name of the customer, his acumen and running a business. He doesn't need to put any real goods down if he's, if he's got a good credit that way. It has nothing to do with savings. Okay. So uh, let me go on. Uh, the advantages of the Chicago plan. And I need to quickly run through the advantages of the Chicago plan now that we have understood these, these, these uh, uh, fundamental. First is a dramatic reduction of the public and private debt. So how would the Chicago plan actually work? So what we did in this paper is we wrote down the balance sheet of the US financial system, which is both the commercial and the shadow banking system, and the numbers here are in percent of GDP. So you have deposits, you have bank equity, you have Basel, et cetera, model here. Uh, you have government bonds, you have investment loans, and you have short-term and mortgage loans on the asset side of the balance sheet. This is, this is from the US flow of funds 2006. The Chicago plan says that you bank, if you have these deposits, you need to back them by reserves of public money, or in Professor Huber's term, these deposits need to become sovereign money. Okay, I'm not, the model itself doesn't make a distinction between that. So then I put reserves, the, the, the bank has to obtain reserves of public money. And the way it does that is by issuing an IOU to the party that gives it the reserves of public money, which is the central bank or the treasury. Okay? The exact institutional arrangements, again, I'm not too uh, precise about it, of course, that is important when you come to doing this in practice. Okay, so then uh, in the next slide, I'll just rearrange the balance sheets. It's nothing is different here, it's just rearranged. And at the bottom, you have money banks which have deposits and reserves. So basically, that's sovereign money. You could even say, in Professor Huber's terms, this is off balance sheet, this is a trust relationship that the bank manages of accounts that are held at the central bank. And at the top, you have the investment trusts that now have a big liability to the public sector in exchange for obtaining the reserves of public money. What the government can now do with this huge credit on uh, the, the, the liability of the banking system and therefore its asset towards the banking system is to use it, for example, to retire the government bonds that are held by the banking system. In the US case, that's only about a quarter of them. And the credit investment trusts would uh, shrink uh, in, in size. The next thing, and this is only illustrative. I emphasize that what we're doing is illustrative. You could think of many different scenarios. Uh, you're saying that the, the uh, government now shares uh, this huge bank account that it, in effect, has uh, with its citizens by giving every citizen uh, a, a credit equal to uh, an an the annual income. Could be the same equal per capita, right? Citizens' accounts. And uh, so then, in net terms, a lot, uh, the net debt of the citizens would now be dramatically reduced 
And for the purpose of the argument here, I'm assuming that it's used to completely repay everything but investment loans. Again, this is illustrated if other scenarios are possible. And so at the end, you end up with a much reduced credit investment trust um, that makes investment loans. And what is happening here is that, that in order to create money, we no longer need debt. And that is reflected in the fact that there is much less debt. Less government debt and less private debt. And here's uh, what's happening to the government balance sheet. Okay, and so on the left you have the original balance sheet of the government, 80% of GDP government bonds, some balancing net assets. I don't really care about what they are. I just wanted a balance sheet that balanced. In the middle, I have this step where we just obtained the reserve backing, uh, the very first step of the Chicago plan. And there the treasury credit appears as an asset of the government. And the reserves are appear on the liability side, but what's very what's very important here is to realize what these reserves are, okay? And so in the US context, um, I, I managed to find a dollar in my wallet. I've been in Europe for a while, but I found a dollar. This is also debt-based money, because uh, the, the debt is, the, is the, the government debt on the other side of the Federal Reserve Bank's balance sheet. Right? This is also debt-based money. Now, I didn't find a coin, so I'm gonna pretend I have a quarter here. It's actually a euro. This, is uh, this is not debt-based money. This is issued by the Treasury in the United States. And when it is issued, in accounting terms, the way it is treated is equity of the government. Equity. This is not debt. right? And, and it's treated as a one-off seniorage gain when I issue this. And what the Chicago plan amounts to is to say that all money, every single cent, should have this form rather than that form or should have it. The billion right? dollar coin. Sorry? The billion dollar coin. Well, you, you, you probably you're not going to pay for ice cream with a billion dollar coin, so you need some small <laughs> ones. Um, okay, and, uh, and, and so in the final analysis, the final balance sheet of the government is uh, the, the government now has, instead of debt, it has reserves. The net treasury credit is, is a positive position on the right hand side there. So what you can see is, is essentially that the government has gone from a net debtor to a credit. Complete elimination of bank runs. Uh, so money is completely safe now because it doesn't depend on the performance of private debts. It's a separate category. And so you could think of the Cyprus situation or whatever, where it's necessary to resolve credit problems. You could resolve those credit problems without ever having to touch the money in people's accounts that they need in order to conduct their business. Very, very important. Large output gains, approaching 10%. I need maybe three more minutes. That's okay, right? Yeah. Uh, so you would have a situation here where everybody, including the government and the private sector, is much less leveraged. And any good model would tell you less leverage, lower spreads, lower real interest rates, higher capital, higher output. And that's exactly what you get. You get uh, output gains in our particular calibration. That's of course subject to endless debates that one can have about particular numbers, 10% output gains. So due to low, lower interest rates, also due to lower tax rates, because you would, you would get a much higher senior rush income uh, than you get now, because you now have a very big money stock that the government adds to in a non-inflationary way every year. As long as the economy is growing, it can add to the money stock without uh, generating any inflation. This is not a whole lot of money, and it's also not discretionary, because uh, uh, there is just an overall envelope of money growth that is set by a, a committee that is independent of the government and the private sector in an ideal form uh, of, of this arrangement, and therefore this, this is not a license for money printing. It's certainly not inflationary per se or as part of, as part of the structure of this system. Uh, I'm going to skip over the third point, and here is something in the paper. You know, I said this is a DSG model. You can model the transition of modeling. What does a fractional reserve system look like? What does a system like look like under the Chicago plan? Everything else held equal in the economy. You would get this transition where on the right-hand side you have uh, you have uh, uh, the lower lending rate, uh, reduced spreads essentially, the lower labor tax rate because of the seniorage income. Uh, that stimulates especially investment uh, and leads to growth to GDP. As I said, the numbers here can of course be debated. I'm, I don't think the principles can be debated. Okay. No liquidity trap. A liquidity trap means the central bank loses its ability to stimulate the economy by increasing the broad money supply. That's one of the meanings, and that's the one I'm going to dwell on. In a fractional reserve banking, only banks can increase the broad money supply, so if you're trying to do it as a central bank, you're pushing on a string. 
And that the Chicago plan, the central bank con directly controls the broad money supply, so the central bank is pushing on a lot. So you have, from that point of view, no liquidity cap. The argument for the zero lower interest rate floor uh, is a little more complicated. I don't have time to go into it, but that is also uh, not of concern uh, under, under the arrangement that is proposed in the paper. Finally, much better control of bank lending during business cycles. Under fractional reserve banking, money creation, the money creation privilege of banks is a major source of credit cycles. That was mentioned by the previous speakers. I don't need to dwell on it. And everybody should read the people in the 1930s, and this were the leading macroeconomists of their time. They all said that. Unfortunately, in the meantime, a lot of their insights have been forgotten. And uh, the Chicago plan uh, would now remove this privilege, and what would that do? Well, first of all, by removing the control over the private issue, over the issuance of money from the private sector, it would remove the ability of the banker to say, hey, you want a loan? I make the money. And I don't need to think, I don't need to wait for granny to walk in the door and deposit something first, right? And so uh, that, that limits the speed with which the banker can react uh, to, to his changes in sentiment, which, you know, sometimes that can be a constraint, and sometimes it can actually be, uh, uh, slow down the economy when it shouldn't, but at the same, this is double-edged sword. At the other, on the other hand, it can also prevent major blowouts. Okay. Uh, in addition, in this kind of economy, you no longer need to control the uh, 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 guarantee the liabilities of the credit part of the banking system the way you need to do today, because you need to control these and, and guarantee these today because they're money. Under the Chicago plan, there will not be money. They would just be commercial debts, and they could not be treated as money. And I have responses to those who say, well, how about substitutes money, but uh, substitute money, but I don't have time to go into that. So a conclusion, last slide. I think for various reasons that nowadays we need a really productive, uh, uh, dynamic productive sector more than ever, and that the way to facilitate that is a really boring financial system, uh, which means a completely safe, 100% crisis-proof payment system, which without any argument, that would definitely be the case uh, under, under the Chicago plan, under Paul Gill. Uh, the, the question is whether other things wouldn't be as good as you want them to be. Uh, but without any argument, it's completely safe. Uh, the lending, and, and you would want lending banks that act as conservative intermediaries. You would, in fact, want lending banks that are as they are depicted in our, in our textbooks, most of our textbooks, almost all the ones that I know, when in reality that's not, not what they actually right? So the Chicago plan has many elements of such a system. Uh, of course, the question is, this is, this is not terribly realistic uh, at this moment in time, okay? But, but uh, if you read the following statement by Martin Wolf, a, a very big article in the Financial Times, April 24, 2014, this will not, he, he was talking about exactly this. He was mentioning this paper and he was mentioning various other organizations in the UK that are working on these questions. This will not happen now, but remember the possibility. When the next crisis comes, and surely it will, we need to be ready. And Ambrose Evans Pritchard at the Daily Telegraph in the UK, also a very high profile journalist, said so essentially the same in an article not, not so long ago. So obviously this is something that you want, you, want to, you want to sort of develop this as a plan that you have in the drawer in case something goes up, and you want to at least have thought about this. Or, at the very minimum, you want to, to use this as a thinking device to think about, well, I want to do something about the health of the financial system. What is the furthest I could go? Maybe I don't want to go all the way, but at least I know and I understand what would happen at this extreme end of the spectrum if I did this type of monetary reform. Thank you very much. Ja, vielen Dank. Heterodoxe Ökonomie bedeutet auch Augenhöhe sein, Strukturen auch mal in Frage stellen und andere Reformen vorschlagen. Es bedeutet aber auch, die simulative Demokratie aus ihrem Tiefschlaf zu wecken. Äh, mit anderen Worten, man diskutiert nicht nur mit Wissenschaftlern, Central Bankern und so weiter, sondern man versucht es auch äh, den einschlummernden äh, Bürgern etwas nachzubringen. Und es gibt ja eine Initiative äh, in der Schweiz zu Vollgeld und ich fände es sehr deplatziert, wenn wir das nicht kurz ansprechen würden. Herr Job hat mich gebeten, dass er zwei, drei Minuten kurz die Schweizer Vollgeldinitiative vorstellt und dann haben wir noch zwei, drei Fragen. Das heißt, die Vollgeldkavallerie kommt von der Schweiz. Ja. Ist das okay von der Aufnahme? Ja. Gut. Also, vielen Dank. Ja, es ist so, 
äh, wir haben uns äh, in der Schweiz mit diesen Theorien befasst, auch mit sehr prominenten Wissenschaftlern, zum Beispiel Hans Christoph Wiesmann, der Vater von Josef Ackermann, er weiß ja, wie die Banken funktionieren. Und mit diesen Leuten zusammen haben wir äh, diese Themen diskutiert und in der Schweiz 2011 den Verein Monetäre Modernisierung gegründet. Und diese Leute sind in unserem wissenschaftlichen Beirat dabei. In der Schweiz gibt es ja auch eine lange Tradition, äh, über diese Frage nachzudenken. Es gibt ja auch äh, eine Bierbank zum Beispiel. Äh, und wir haben diesen Verein gegründet, äh, auch mit Herrn Kuba natürlich äh, diskutiert und mit einem äh, ebenfalls prominenten Staatswissenschaftler, Professor an der PSG Universität St. Gallen, haben wir einen Verfassungsentwurf äh, gemacht, wie man die Schweizer Bundesverfassung ändern könnte, um eine folgende Reform äh, einzuführen in der Schweiz. Wir haben dazu einen äh, Verfassungstext verfasst äh, und wir haben jetzt im Juni, am 3. Juni dieses Jahres, haben wir die Folgeinitiative lanciert, gestartet. Das bedeutet, dass wir jetzt innerhalb von 18 Monaten 100.000 Unterschriften sammeln möchten und dann gibt es in der Schweiz eine Volksabstimmung darüber, ob in der Schweiz das Vollgeldsystem eingeführt werden sollte. Das ist ja eine Möglichkeit, eine sehr spezielle Möglichkeit in der Schweiz, weil es dort eben dieses Mittel der direkten Demokratie gibt. Und in dieser Verfassungsänderung wollen wir eben das Geldmonopol der Schweizer Nationalbank ausweiten auf das Girardgeld. Das ist äh, die zentrale Änderung eigentlich. 18, im, im Ende des äh, 19. Jahrhunderts, ich glaube es war 1871, hat das Schweizer Volk entschieden, äh, dass dieses Geldmonopol auch auf äh, Banknoten ausgeweitet werden sollte, weil es ja vorher eine Vielzahl von Banknoten äh, im Umlauf waren in der Schweiz. Und das führte zu großen Problemen. Und dann hat eben das Schweizer Volk entschieden, die Schweizerische Nationalbank soll das Monopol haben, um eben die Sicherheit zu gewährleisten, die Sicherheit und äh, auch die entsprechende Ausstattung der schweizerischen Wirtschaft mit Geld. Und jetzt wollen wir einen Schritt weiter gehen. Eben die technische Entwicklung hat uns da überholt und wir wollen dieses Geldmonopol ausweiten auf elektronisches Geld und natürlich sicherstellen, dass die Schweizerische Nationalbank nicht Spielbank, Spielball der aktuellen Politik wird, sondern dass sie als unabhängige Institution im Sinne einer Demokratie, könnte man sagen, als vierte Gewalt, unabhängig eine Geldpolitik führt im Gesamtinteresse der schweizerischen Wirtschaft und eben nichts mit fiskalischen Gesichtspunkten hat das zu tun, sondern eine adäquate äh, Versorgung der Wirtschaft mit Geld, damit sie funktioniert. Keine Deflation, keine Inflation, sondern eben das, was die Wirtschaftswissenschaftler auch eigentlich wissen, was es braucht. Ja, vielen Dank und alles Gute. Danke. Ja. Herr Kummer, ähm, Erwin Fischer und Milton Friedman haben ja zu den Ersten gehört, die das unterstützt haben. Und ich glaube, von allen Volkswirten, die sich jemals dazu geäußert haben, also jetzt unabhängige Wissenschaftler, ist eigentlich niemand gegen die Forschung. Also die, die Vorteile dieses Chicago-Plans sind einfach zu zwingen, also Steuerbarkeit der Geldmenge und äh, im Grunde Ausschaltung der Gefahr eines Bankplans. Nur aus meiner Sicht als Finanzwissenschaftler würde ich einen der Vorteile, die Sie da geschildert haben, rausnehmen. Das ist aus meiner Sicht der einzige Nachteil, das muss man den Leuten auch ehrlich sagen. Das Ganze ist eine nahrhafte Steuererhöhung. Und zwar, wenn man das in der Eurozone machen würde, wäre das eine Steuererhöhung so in der Größenordnung 20, 30 Milliarden Euro. Sie haben einen benevolenten Staat in Ihrem DSGI-Modell, der das sofort durch, Verzerrung, durch Senken verzerrender Steuern zurückschlossen. 
Wir haben also ein Balanced Budget. In der Realität wird das so sein, wenn der Staat diese zusätzlichen Steuern kriegt, wird er kaum andere senken. Die Steuererhöhung beruht darauf, dass im Moment die Seniorage im Grunde zwischen Zentralbanken und Geschäftsbanken geteilt wird und der größte Teil der Seniorage geht an die Geschäftsbanken in der Inzidenz, wird dann aber, Stichwort kostenloses Girokonto, im Wettbewerb der Geschäftsbanken natürlich an die Kunden weitergegeben. Wenn, wenn die keine Seniorage mehr kriegen, die Banken, dann gibt es auch kein kostenloses Girokonto, sondern dann wird man für sein Girokonto ordentlich was bezahlen. Auf der anderen Seite werden die Einnahmen des Staates aus der Seniorage stark wachsen. Wenn es jetzt so wäre, wie in einem benevolenten Modell, dass der Staat zum Beispiel die Mehrwertsteuer senkt oder so, dann wäre das eine gute Sache. Aber Public-Choice-mäßig gedacht, würde das zusätzliche Geld einsacken und der Bürger wird insgesamt stärker belastet. Ja, ich glaube, das, äh, mit der, was Sie über die Regierung sagen, ist, äh, ist im Grunde ja eine Glaubenserklärung und nicht, nicht wissenschaftlich. Ne? Äh, Public <lacht> Choice ist auch wissenschaftlich. <lacht> Deswegen werde ich mich da äh, raushalten. Ähm, äh, und äh, und äh, die, andere, die, die andere Einwand, äh, da ist natürlich was dran. Die Banken, im, ich werde das mal umformulieren, die Banken im gegenwärtigen System können äh, Geld drucken sozusagen auf ihren Computern äh, und da äh, einen relativ niedrigen Zinssatz drauf zahlen. Und wenn sie äh, competitive sind, das ist natürlich eine Frage, und das muss nicht unbedingt der Fall sein, äh, das muss, da, da würde ich auch gerne mal äh, empirische Evidence drüber sehen, das ist nicht, nicht unbedingt der Fall. Ähm, aber wenn sie, das, wenn, wenn sie competitive wären, dann würden sie das ja durch niedrigere Basiszinssätze äh, an ihre äh, the borrowers. The borrowers would, would, would get lower interest rates because the rate at which the bank can fund itself is low because it can issue money and therefore there would be a lower interest rate for the borrowers and that would ceteris paribus uh, be, be beneficial for the real economy. Okay? Well, first of all, the actual uh, amount of lending that takes place to uh, companies that produce real capital uh, in a typical economy like the UK is somewhere around 10%. A lot of the other lending doesn't go into this real capital accumulation. It goes into asset price, uh, asset purchases and stuff like that. But let's, fo let's focus on those 10%, which, which is what we do, by the way, in this model. And, and what happens there is, is that, yes, there is this effect, and it's my calculation is about one to one and a half percentage point advantage that is lost there in, in, in lending to, to the wall. Of what? A percentage point of any loan that is made, right? So that, uh, and uh, what, what, what happens at the same time is that every borrower, including the government, which kind of determines the overall leverage of interest rates in the economy, is much, has much lo less leverage. Much, and the government loses all leverage if it wants to, right? And so there is empirical evidence that, that says, and, and any model will tell you that that is going to lower the level of real interest rates. And then it's a race between those two effects that you, between the effect that I just mentioned and the effect that you have in mind. And in our model, this other effect of lower leverage and therefore lower real interest rates, lower spreads prevails so that real interest rates actually are lower, not higher, to borrowers uh, in the final equilibrium. Okay, but this is a quantitative question that one can, one can argue about and you know, I'm very happy to do more research. Ja, wir haben noch äh, zwei Fragen. Die erste kommt von einem Studenten, der beim Netzwerk Plurale Ökonomik ist. Und ich möchte mal ausdrücklich äh, mich bedanken beim Netzwerk der kritischen äh, Studenten, ohne die zum Beispiel in Göttingen wir das nicht hätten aufziehen können. Und äh, das Wichtigste ist ja praktisch äh, die Jugend sozusagen. Und ähm, also danke schon mal vorab. Obwohl ich weiß, dass Sie jetzt eine kritische Frage stellen. Sehr kritisch. <lacht> Ja, hallo, ich werde auch auf ähm, Englisch antworten, weil ich es mal ein bisschen zusammengeschrieben habe. Um, yeah, I want to, to uh, make uh, four short points to uh, criticize the idea of your um, um, full research banking. Um, first, um, as uh, already before mentioned, uh, for preventing destructive asset bias uh, bubbles or smithing to the business cycle, monetary targeting is um, not suitable. Um, as the monetary experiments uh, have shown and um, has said, but uh, you uh, chosen, have chosen um, a Friedman uh, um, money room in your model. And um, the second, bank runs and financial stability is possible to achieve uh, with less radical measures.
measures like higher equity ratios and stronger liquidity regulation or uh, a new insolvency regime in the Eurozone. Third, um, as uh, Mr. Homburg uh, said, uh, expected sell-off profits are a simple tax on the deposits. So when you uh, want to um, tax the public sector, um, you should uh, make this uh, through um, a simple tax. And uh, fourthly, in your uh, full reserve banking or also in the, in the FOIPED system, it is um, important to say that the repayment of uh, debt leads um, always not to a reduction uh, of the quantity of money. Like in our present money credit system where debt repayment um, is the storing money. That means that the reduction of the public debt has no positive effect on the level of the interest rate because the wealth owners um, need um, interest payments to hold money in their uh, currency according to the equilibrium rate of interest. And also the reduction of the private debt in your model um, is, so, is simple socializing the risk for the wealth owners to liable for their investment decision. Because after your reform, the wealth owners are holding now safe central bank money in an uh, enormous uh, quantity, liquid, instead of risky deposits. Um, and um, while the risk for misallocation by the former debtors still exists, yeah, the debtors have lower debt, and um, there's no uh, bank which is um, monitoring um, the usage of the. Um, yeah, of for the corporation, and therefore your lower monetary costs uh, in your model are no advantage because of the increasing uh, risk of misallocation caused by a uh, lower debt burden and the uh, absence of monetary. Okay, so we'll start with. Okay, so um, asset price model, the monetary charging per se doesn't take care of that. If you read my paper carefully, there is a rule, a money growth rule, right? And that's fine. And I think we need something like that, although it's not as rigid as in the DSG model. In reality, there has to have to be some wise men that need to be independent from everybody, fourth power of government, for example. And they need to sort of get the money supply right. But if you read the paper carefully, there are also two interest rates that the government controls, namely the rate at which it can temporarily lend new money into existence to banks. And also, and this is not even actually, this is not mentioned in the paper, but it's possible to work with, you can also change the interest rate that you pay on money, because you know money is a very broad concept, and some longer term forms of money will attract a certain interest rate. And so you do not necessarily have this dichotomy of the pool paper where you say you either control money or you control interest rate. That's actually not true here. You can, you can, you can do both, um, and, and uh, uh, therefore you, you can do fine tuning. Not in the same way that you do it today, but not in a radically different way either, I would, I would argue. Uh, as far as asset price bubbles are concerned, actually, I would like to say, because you brought it up, and I would like to use that, uh, it doesn't answer your question directly, but if you think about what asset price bubbles are, you have, in our, in our economy, real estate, it's, all, it's almost all land, right? Land, a completely fixed asset. So you have something that banks use as collateral, that's land, it's a fixed supply. And at the same time, their own, they can lend against that. And they can change how much they want to lend against that. And technically, not, not business-wise, but technically, there is no limit to how much they can change their lending against land. In principle, they could double it overnight because it's only a bookkeeping contract. Now, of course, they're never going to do that because they would lose their pants, right? But in principle, they could do that. So you have a completely fixed uh, a thing that you're lending against, and a completely, in principle, technically, uh, a flexible uh, a way in which you can lend against it, that's, of course, a recipe for asset price inflation. If ever somebody gets it wrong, of course, if they don't get it wrong, no problem, right? So I just wanted to mention that. Um, so then uh, you have uh, bank runs are easy enough to avoid in other ways. I don't disagree with that. You know, I've been, I've, I've been having 
discussions with this about this on and off with the Dan Turner from the from the UK. He's brilliant and he goes around and constantly thinks about these things and he updates his thinking, etc. And he's sort of halfway between where we are today and the Chicago plan in the sense of saying, yeah, we want higher equity requirements, we want higher liquidity requirements, we want something that resembles window guidance that we had uh, in the, in the post-war period in East Asia and also in Europe. Um, and that way we would, we would be much more likely to avoid bankruptcy. I don't disagree with that. I'm just saying that with this system, you would not, it would not just be more likely, it would be 100% certain. And I'll just, that's all I'm pointing out. Uh, Saint Mirage, I think I'd already mentioned that, and, and I don't, don't want to go there again. Um, uh, risk for misallocation of credit. The, the, for your fourth question, I, question, I didn't understand the first part, so I'm going to take the liberty of not answering that part. Um, and the second part had something to do with the risk for misallocation of credit is still there. Yeah, of course. Right? I mean, uh, uh, changing the monetary system does not mean, you, you, you're not changing mon uh, uh, human nature with that. Right? And human nature is that they, humans can do stupid things. They can, they can make really stupid loans, and you can get credit problems, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and of course, you know, given that credit would still be required under a system like that, it can also be bad credit. All I'm trying to say here is that there are many reasons why we have credit. There's credit because somebody is rich and somebody is poor, and the poor guy has a good business proposition. Yes, that's of course true. But there is one fundamental reason that, that we have so much debt for, that is we can only have money if we have debt under the present system. Okay? And therefore, at the margin, if we no longer need to have debt to have money, then we need somewhat less debt. Now, how much less debt is a question that you know, we try to answer as much as possible in this paper by quantifying everything and going to the data. Uh, but of course, you know, that's something one can argue about. But I think certainly the tendency would be to have less debt. So I, I probably didn't answer the, what you really asked with your fourth question because I didn't understand the first part. Okay, okay. last question. Okay. I've heard this paper twice, I still like it. But I actually I have to kind of side with Stefan. There's, you know, the, the, the Gewalt in Hit Against the Red uh, has been thinking about this problem for a long time. And I'm wondering, you know, what's what's the problem? It's like Glass Steagall. You're basically separating the, the, the payment system from the, the gambling part and the investment part. What's to prevent the investment banks from starting their own parallel means of payment and issuing unlimited quantities? As much as the, the collective system wants to hold, you'll still have risk of bubbles. You'll still, I mean, the only problem is they'll be respecting somebody else. The only way you can stop that is to actually prohibit investment banks from issuing their own substitute money. Yeah, that's a really tough nut to crack. You, can, you can't regulate Wall Street anyway. Try doing that. Yeah, well, uh, and Henry, you're absolutely right. And that is, of course, I, I always say, uh, he's writing it down. I don't want to forget this point. Uh, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, Henry Simons, he was very aware of this problem. All, all the people who advocated this were very aware of this problem. And the way I always put it is, uh, there are all these advantages that are outlined to you today, but there are one and a half problems with it. The one big problem is, of course, how do I get from here to there, which I never talked about, and that's, of course, a biggie, right? And that's why you only want to do it if you really thought it through, and if your options have narrowed a lot because maybe you're in a big run. The other one, the half one, is the substitute money. And they all thought about this, and there is a host of proposals out there. But the first thing I want to say is, when we approach this problem these days, we always think, because that's sort of a reflex, that we, because we've been doing this for so many years, we want to touch these banks with satin gloves, somehow. We don't want to get too strict with them, right? I think the first thing that we need to do is drop that attitude, okay? Uh, <laughs> and, and secondly, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of, um, well, I am actually explaining my slides, right? Uh, <laughs> the, uh, there are a lot of proposals that these people made uh, in their writings about how you could avoid substitute monies being created. The most obvious one is Larry Kotlikoff's limited purpose banking, in which the credit part of the banking system would be entirely financed by mutual funds that would issue shares, equity-like shares that are inherently risky. And in fact, I've been talking to a French economist about certain mutual funds that existed in the States and Europe. I don't remember how the argument went, but they were structured in, in, in such a way that 
Some of them had their nominal value guaranteed and some of them didn't. And it made a huge difference to how people use them, right? And so if, if they don't have their nominal value guaranteed, if there is in essence equity, then people would be much less likely to use them as money. Number two, you could say, and this is an old argument, is you want to prohibit any payments to the government, to and from the government, in anything other than uh, public money, which would be tax payments, anything in the bond market where you interact with the government, you can only make that with this kind of money. You know, then your other money would be pretty low quality because that's a very frequent transaction. Uh, then you could remove all tax advantages for debt and in fact create tax disadvantages for debt and, and favor equity, which would again go in the equity cost direction, right? Um, and what else? Uh, majority mismatch, you know, if you do allow uh, uh, um, fixed income liabilities of the credit part of the banking system, then you will want to regulate that with majority mismatch regulation. And you know, then you're starting to get a little more, you know, you have to get firm with banks, you have to really make sure that they, uh, that they adhere to that. But in principle, uh, that's rule. And then you could, you could outright forbid it, but I think these, uh, the creation of such monies, but I think these, uh, these uh, uh, points that I was mentioned to you are already very strong. Ja, vielen Dank für Ihre freundliche Geduld und Katrin Lahm für Ihr Aufnahme.